Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Now in continuation of uh, what we have discussed in the previous class. In the previous class we have started the discussion about uh, digital assets and that was classified as digital assets part 1. Now uh, if you haven't watched that particular class I would instruct you to stop this class right away and watch that one first otherwise this discussion is not going to make any sense for you if you haven't done the background work which was basically covered in the first part. So in this uh, first part what did we discuss? We primarily discussed about what are digital assets. Second thing what is DLT that is distributed ledger technology which is also known as blockchain. Now how does a blockchain work? and uh, what are the prerequisites of a blockchain all we have discussed in the previous class. At the later part of the previous class we came to one point and that was basically how do people agree that a transaction is valid before it is recorded that is once the transaction is placed into blockchain there has to be some kind of you know agreement to that that yes it is all fine and then only entry is made. We have learned one thing that once the transaction is entered it cannot be modified, it cannot be altered, it cannot be deleted, it is permanently going to be there. So before it is placed into the system, before it is recorded who is going to check that? So that is where consensus mechanism come into picture. and you need to understand that this paragraph at the end I told you it is very very important and consensus mechanisms are like voting systems of the blockchain world. They ensure that before writing anything into the diary enough people have double checked and said yes this is correct. So we have discussed all this and then we also went through a small discussion about types of consensus mechanism that was all about proof of work and proof of stake. I did not tell you what is proof of work and what is proof of stake but I have just introduced these two terms for you and uh, let me now enter into the domain of what is proof of work and what is proof of stake. Now you would have heard people calling uh, some you know operators as miners, miners in blockchain technology. Who are miners? So it is a bit technical term and uh, people get confused as in what is the role of miner. So you understand it this way, there are complex algorithms and complex mathematical problems that needs to be solved. And of course this is not done manually, it is done through computerized systems and networks. So creation of blockchain requires this kind of problem solving technique. This kind of problem solving is basically an effort that is put into the system. So whoever is putting the effort to solve a problem will be eligible to create a block. That is where someone who is doing that these people are called miners. So miners as in not M-I-N-O-R minor it is M-I-N-E-R minor. So miners are basically creators of blockchain they keep creating blockchains. Now how does the validation come into picture? So that is where the proof of work is what we are aiming at. So let us look into what is all about proof of work. So proof of work POW it is like race to solve a very tough puzzle. Every participant called a miner competes to solve a complex mathematical problem. Whoever solves it first gets the right to add the new block to the blockchain they get a reward like Bitcoin for their effort. Now initially long back when this uh, point was introduced like uh, Bitcoin when it came into picture. So who creates Bitcoin was the question because there is no physical form of that Bitcoin. 
so people say that you know miners they mine the bitcoin uh, what they do actually is they solve complex mathematical problems and that is where on submission of the proof of work they get rewarded by bitcoin nowadays what is happening people are trading in bitcoin but that was the time when you know people were involved in minting bitcoin so minting of bitcoin not everyone can do you need to have that you know capacity of you know doing that or entering into that algorithm basically it is primarily done through computer systems but yes if you want to have your technical knowledge involved into the process and you want to mine the bitcoin you can definitely do that so bitcoin is basically a reward and the reward need not necessarily be in the form of bitcoin bitcoin is the most popular example that is why i am mentioning the same so in case you want to take note of this take a screenshot or you can pause the video and take note of this and then i take you ahead all right let us move ahead and now we talk about highlights of pow that is proof of work it requires very high computational power slower transition speeds consumes lot of electricity because so many computers are solving puzzles 24 by 7 it secures the blockchain by making cheating extremely expensive and difficult if you want you may pause the video and take note of this all right so what we have understood over here is it is primarily the mining work which is the complex problem solving which is causing creation of new blocks in the blockchain so as and when new blocks are getting added the blockchain continues now one side a block is created with the effort put in over there that is why we call it as proof of work because there is some work done to create that block once this block is created it also makes sure that there will be no cheating involved means because it's a you know system where someone can enter and you know with some cheating they may create additional blocks without actually putting the real effort this is not going to happen it is such a secured system so over here the role of miner is to solve the complex problems and to get rewarded in the form of bitcoin or other similar assets now this is basically what we call as mining of the bitcoin or mining of cryptocurrency so frequently when i'm mentioning bitcoin bitcoin is one of the digital asset category which we call as cryptocurrency now digital assets categories i'm going to discuss in the next part so i'm not entering into that domain right now just because i wanted to mention that bitcoin comes in that category of cryptocurrency so this is basically the reward for the miner now one side we have proof of work where work done effort put in is the base for developing digital assets in the form of cryptocurrencies like bitcoin where blockchains are created now there is another set of people who get involved who are not miners but they are validators validation is their work so in the whole blockchain technology you can say the direct work involvement is of a miner and of a validator so we have already looked into what is the case with miner let us now focus on the work to be done by the validator which is in the second category that is proof of stake pos in proof of stake there is no race or puzzle solving here participants who are basically known as validators what is their role they are chosen based on how much cryptocurrency they have stacked or logged into the system the more you stake the higher your chance to be selected to validate the next block it's like saying if you are serious enough to lock your own money into the system we trust you more validators are chosen 
based on how much cryptocurrency they lock or stake into the network. First you may take note of this whole thing by pausing the video and then I take you ahead. Alright, so once you have noted this, let me explain you something important. So, two categories of work to be done. One was the mining work, one is the validation work. Miners can be anyone, but validators cannot be anyone. Who becomes a validator? Only selected people will become validator. Now here it is not about how much effort you are putting in. It's about how much money you are putting in. Money not in the currency form, but money in the form of digital asset itself. So how much of this cryptocurrency you are putting at stake? So the more money is involved in the network, the more of faith these people will have and they will be chosen as validators. The idea behind choosing validators is it shows the seriousness or commitment in the system. So whoever is obviously putting such valuable asset in the system as their own investment, they will be considered as validators or they will be chosen as validators. So you may acquire cryptocurrencies or you may generate cryptocurrencies by mining, accumulate these currencies and put that as a stake in the system if you want to become a validator. And it, there is no guarantee that you will still become a validator. You will be chosen only when you are a chosen validator, then that status come into you. And here it is about proof of stake, not a proof of work. Now, once we have written this whole thing and understood this, let us have fine pointers relating to this. That is highlights of POS far more energy efficient than POW faster and scalable no massive computational race selection happens based on stake and randomization validators earn rewards like ethereum 2.0 for validating transactions honestly so quickly take note of these pointers and then i'll discuss these points so what we have seen earlier if the primary reward for the miners was in the form of bitcoin or similar other cryptocurrencies the reward for the validators is in the form of ethereum which now is ethereum 2.0 or you can call it ethereum 2.0 so this ethereum was basically the reward for validators validators are not getting rewarded for the proof of work they are getting rewarded for proof of stake and they are becoming validators based on trust. They are expected to do the work honestly because they are the major stakeholders in the system. Correct? So in the system, whoever is putting more stake, they are becoming validators and these validators will be validating each and every entry in the blockchain. So I'm sure you have understood the role of miners as well as validators. And we have understood POW and POS. Now, we can conclude one thing. Both POW and POS have the same goal. That is to maintain trust and fairness in the blockchain. The only difference is in how they achieve that trust. In POW, trust is built through effort. In POS, trust is built through commitment. So if you want, you may take note of this by pausing the video or take the screenshot and then I take you ahead. All right, friends, let us move ahead. And now we answer a very important question. How are these blockchains structured? Are they open for everyone? Are they accessible with special permissions? Now to answer these questions, we are entering into the next round of our discussion that is different categories of DLT network, DLT, digital ledger technology, which is basically representing blockchains. So we have two categories of blockchain networks. One is titled as permissioned network and another is permissionless network. So under permissionless network, you don't have to seek anyone's permission. Anyone can be part of that network, but permissioned network is always accessible only on the grant of permission. So we conclude that
types of DLT networks, number one, it could be the permissionless network and the second, it could be permission network. So in case you would want to take note of these categories, quickly write it. All right, friends, let us move ahead. And now we look into these two categories, getting started with permissionless networks, which is open to all. In a permissionless network, anyone can join, verify transactions and even create new blocks. No prior approval is needed. No one asks you for your ID, name or background. You just connect to your computer to the network and start participating. This encourages global participation and true decentralization. Anonymous participation is possible. Slower speed and higher energy consumption could be important features of permissionless networks. Quickly take note of this and then I take you ahead. So we are putting this uh, first category into our discussion that is permissionless network. Because it is permissionless network, anyone can participate. And here in true sense, the decentralization is happening. That means there is no one to grant permission. As a result, anyone can, you know, take the access without any permission required. Now there could be a small trouble over here. Just imagine if anyone can participate, then the data available in the system, which for some reason should not have been open to all. Like for example, the records of banks, the records of a healthcare center, a research center. In that case, if you grant open access to all some data, which was considered to be confidential, may not remain confidential. And that is why for certain institutions like this, the type of network to be applied cannot be a permissionless network. It has to be a permissioned network. So let me take you to that part as well. That is the permissioned network. So the second category over here we have is about permissioned networks, which is typically representing controlled access. In a permissioned network, entry is controlled only selected participants who are verified or approved by a central authority or a group are allowed to join and interact with the blockchain access is restricted different levels of permission some can only view some can add and update records higher privacy and security but because of this there will be faster transaction processing easier to comply with regulations because it is controlled and it is used in industries like banking, supply chain, healthcare, where data privacy is crucial. You may want to pause the video and take note of these pointers quickly and then I take you ahead. All right, friends, once you have completed writing these, let us move ahead and conclude the matter. Both networks have their strengths and weaknesses. Permissionless network bring the spirit of freedom, openness and global trust. Permission networks bring control, efficiency and compliance for business needs. Understanding these two types help you see how digital assets are built, whether open for societies or specific corporate environments only.